So that was the kind of gist of it. Yeah. Many people associate improv with mental dexterity, thinking quickly on your feet, quick reactions, particularly in a sort of comedic context. But there really is a system there and it can be learned. And you sort of decoded in the book into sort of three connected phases. Can you just walk us through um, how you sort of decoded the practice of improv? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, the journey begins with a meeting in Portland, Oregon, actually, in the Three Lions Bakery mm. with a guy called Gary Hirsch. And I was meeting to talk to him about something else. But along the way, he happened to mention he does this improv comedy stuff. And at that point, I had assumed that this was a special talent that some people had. And I looked at him and, to be honest, he didn't look particularly talented. And I can say that because he's, <laughs> he's a great friend and a business partner of mine now. But so I said to him, so how do you do that? And the very first thing he said was, it's just a matter of practice. And this idea that some a skill of that level could be just a question of practice and not a question of talent was really interesting to me. So we, we ended up talking about that instead of the thing we were meant to talk about. And so... That was the first glimpse for me of there's something here you can take and use because practice, as you know, in and of itself is a really useful idea. Practice is not something you do and you're done with. It's something you do and keep doing. So mm -hmm. that's at the core. That, that was how my journey began in understanding that the core of this method is a set of practices which you can identify and learn. Now, in the theatre, people use it for a particular purpose, which is to create comedy or, or stories and, and to entertain. But it struck me that there was a lot of parallels here with the complexity science I'd got very interested in, and that here was a simple set of ideas that could be taken and used. And it took me a long while to kind of isolate them in this in this kind of very succinct way. Uh, and and yet they they are kind of disarmingly simple. So the uh, mm. the idea really of you know three interconnected practices of noticing more and what you do with your attention, of of letting go of assumptions and beliefs and and micro agendas and opening yourself up to the possibility in the moment and of, of using anything and everything that comes your way without worrying about whether it's what you expected or what you wanted. And we can go into those in more detail, but just to say the combination of those things just held lightly and iterated endlessly is extraordinarily powerful. And it's that that, that is the skill that you develop by simply taking those simple rules of thumb and applying and reapplying and asking yourself the same questions over and again in, in new contexts. And that kind of builds a muscle and a capacity that enables you to, to feel very different when you're besieged and beleaguered by change and difficulty. And it gives your mind somewhere to go other than into a spin. And it's very anchoring. The thing is about mental dex dexterity, improvisation is not really a mental skill i know people think that we can talk about this later if you like because it's that assumption that it's about speed of mind that led to me writing the second book but really it's about using what howard garner at harvard would call all your intelligences so it's about tapping into your embodied and physical intelligence it's about what you do uh with your with your heart as well as with your mind if you will and about an attitude and a way of being so it's not just about being clever if it's about being clever at all. And in the improv theatre world, they, they actually think of cleverness as a kind of bit of a problem. It tends to get in the way. If by clever, you mean that sort of clever, clever, trying to come up with a gag kind of thing. Um, it can yeah. be useful. But I think, so I think it's a much more rounded, much more interesting skill than just thinking quickly. Hmm, I like that um, uh, phrase that I learned in the context of design thinking work, uh, where expertise is the enemy of innovation like yeah. if you that, that cleverness thing but let, let's unpack each one of those if we can because i think they're really useful just as, as principles uh, uh of operating particularly in you know my field here of the l and d space um I, the, these are three nudges that i think are really important mm. to talk well, let's start by kind of noticing more what is what is what does it mean to notice more um in in the context of this practice because I think the first thing you have to realize is that you have a choice about what you pay attention to, that our senses are not neutral scientific instruments passively detecting information that comes in. So mm -hmm. what you pay attention to, I could argue, is the most important question or one of the most important questions a leader faces. And people will notice what you pay attention to. So here, if you like, when you, we're, we're noticing that our attention itself is something we can work with and make different choices that will make a difference. So 
the other thing is, but it's encouraging you to, as an improviser would say, lean forward into your senses. We often find ourselves, uh, imagine in a meeting or, or uh, uh, while well, you're kind of working on stuff, it's very easy to get lost in anxiety or expectation or hopes or assumptions or beliefs about the way things are going to happen. You know, so somebody starts to say something in a meeting and your mind races ahead and says, oh, God, he's going to go on about that thing, about what happens in Asia Pacific. And he always does that. And actually, Asia Pacific's not a problem and all that stuff. And, and you can you can so you can often find yourself not really noticing anything at all. You're in your own head talking to your own ghosts and phantasms. Um, and so this invitation to actually pay attention to what, pay you, what you pay attention to and to lean into your senses, to notice what's right in front of you, to really listen to what people are saying, to listen to the mood and tone, not just the content, to notice in yourself your own responses. And this is an infinite job. You can't notice everything. That's impossible. But you can notice more. And that brings you into presence, to actually being here right now instead of worrying about what has happened or what will happen. And actually, that window of where we are right now is arguably the only thing we have to work with anyway. So if you spend half your time mentally absent to that, that's a problem. So this invitation to notice more, very simple, but I think very powerful. Um, and it kind of leads into the next one, uh, which it doesn't really matter which order they go in because they're all connected. But I tend to think of that leading to using to using everything because once you start paying attention, then you're kind of all, you're asking yourself, well, what have I got? And how can I, how can I use what I've got? So the second piece of practice is encouraging you to think of anything and everything that happens as, as it were, fuel for your process, fuel for your, um, for your ideas, for your creativity, for your learning. And that includes mm -hmm. things that we might more commonly call mistakes or failures or shortcomings or shortages. So it's a very constructive attitude. Um, it's a, it's nothing new here. I mean, this is very, very old. I mean, it's, it's reminiscent of the Theodore Roosevelt quote about do what you can with what you have mm. where you are, you know. So um, it's just saying to you, well, you know, use what, what have you got. Don't judge it or, or, or wish for something else, you know. Um, a classic illustration of this that I often use is that scene from the, uh, from the, the great Apollo movie, you know, where they chuck all the bits on the table and the gene yes. gene Krantz says to them you know you've got to make one of these fit in there with one of those well essentially yeah. on a grander scale that's that's what this practice is encouraging you to think of all the time and in order to do that that leads naturally to the third one which is about letting go um and this is about letting go of many different things but perhaps primarily letting go of the idea that things will happen the way you want them to, because we've all lived, you don't have to live very long in this world to realize that's not going to happen. But somehow, somehow we sort of cling on to this idea that we can force the world to submit to our desires if we just try a bit harder. Um, whereas if you kind of let go of that idea and allow yourself to say, well, well, let me, let me let go of something. You don't have to let go of everything, but let me go, let me let go of my expectation about what the man's going to say about Asia Pacific in the meeting. Let me really listen to him. Maybe I could let go of a belief or an assumption. Sometimes I might have to let go of something a bit bigger. Probably this is happening right now for people in lockdown where people are having to let go of some of their identity. So if you're the kind of person who, fill in the blank, you know, I think of myself as a whatever. A, a world lockdown, traveler. A, world traveler. There you go. That's a good yeah. one. Uh, you're having to, having to let, let go of that. And this one I think is the most counterintuitive because I think in our society, quite understandably, we're we're brought up to think about holding on to things. So, you know, from a child, hold on to the, hold on to mummy's hand all the way through to hold on to that job, hold on to that account, hold on to that business. But I think that if we try and hold on to everything all the time, there's no space for anything new. So these, these three all work together because if you kind of, if you let go of your head, your, your thoughts racing ahead of you, that allows you to notice more. If you notice what that, what's happening in the room in front of you and how you're feeling about it, you might be able to let go of your assumptions or beliefs. If you're prepared to take and use something that might be otherwise called a failure, then you're letting go of that judgment that it's gone wrong and you're asking a much more constructive question, which is, well, this has happened, how can we use it? So it's all connected. It, it, it all seems to fit very much in the frame of the growth mindset principles Carol Dweck's work and this, uh, yep. you know, this idea of of, of curios curiosity being a superpower, 
is it hard to do these things? Is it something that you need to learn and mm. and, and and make deliberate uh, choices to do? Yeah, I mean, takes me back to the beginning of the story. It's about practice. So my view is that most things that are worth doing require practice, and most things that don't require practice probably aren't worth doing. So I think that the 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 sense and the and the helpfulness of it can be very quickly apparent to people. So I've worked with many people, hundreds of people over the years for whom this becomes a kind of moment of insight and enlightenment, but then they have to go on and practice and you have to try it out for yourself and you have to kind of get it into your repertoire and you have to get it into your body as well, I would say. So, and it does require effort. What's interesting though, is it requires a different kind of effort. It's not a kind of pushing forceful uh, kind of an effort. It's more about, being willing to hold and pay attention in a different way. So I'm, you know, I've, I often joke that I'm kind of lifelong obsession with laziness and, and, and thinking laziness gets a bad press. And I don't mean that literally, but what I mean is sometimes I think we spend a lot of energy and effort doing things that don't make a difference. And what this work is encouraging you to do is to pay close attention to a few small things, a few small practices and behaviors that can make an enormous difference. And it requires a different kind of effort. It, it requires a sort of discipline and a rigor um, to not fall into patterns. And that does require practice. But I suppose just going back to the Carol Dweck thing, I think, you know, I think we have both those tendencies in us. I think, you know, fixed and growth mindset, I think if you look back at evolutionary history, we're always going to need both. There's the sort of protective and the secure the security one. And then there's the kind of, you know, finding the edge and hunting and finding the new food. And there's a lovely quote from the improv guru, Keith Johnston. He says, um, there are two kinds of people in this world, those that say yes and those that say no. Those that say yes are rewarded by the adventures they have. And those that say no are rewarded by the security they attain. Unfortunately, there are more no-sayers than yes-sayers. And what I like about that is, is it says there is a place for both. So often people coming from the world I, I'm sort of steeped in of improv theatre will go out there and say, oh, it's all about saying yes. Well, that's just unrealistic. And you can't say yes to everything and you wouldn't want to. And that doesn't even work in the improv theatre. So, so no, understood through the Johnson lens, is about that security. And it's important. Sometimes security is important. But if we want novelty, if we want learning, if we want to grow and develop, then the adventure of yes is really important. And we have to learn to exercise and practice that muscle. I don't know whether you're familiar with the, the Bill Gates quote, give me a lazy man to solve a problem, because I know he's going to do it in the most efficient way. And I don't think it's gender <laughs> bias, but um, I, I thought you might like that. I haven't heard that. It's a lovely one. Yeah, I'll try and remember that. One thing that we've sort of learned from analyzing all the data we can get now on what people people are interested in learning is there's been this sort of resurgence in, in interest in the so-called soft skills. You know, you would think naturally that everybody would want to get trained on coding in C Sharp and Ruby on Rails. And in fact, what people really want is these very human things like the ability to communicate and collaborate and uh, lead and so on and so forth. Do you think that's a false dichotomy? And how does your um, sort of worldview around improv sort of play into being being a better being a better learner? Well, I suppose I'm not a fan of sharp divisions, so maybe I do think it's a false dichotomy. I think everything's contextual, so there are contexts where you need technical skills, and there is no substitute for them. Um, uh, being, uh, but 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 they run out. There are other contexts where they're nowhere near enough. I think that perhaps over time, you know, this resurgence you talk about is a reaction to what came before, was a sort of a view where the world is seen as a technical system, when in actual fact, it's a techno social system, that actually everything that human beings do, we do in company, and we can do very little on our own. And so if that's the case, yeah. then the so called soft skills, which that metaphor originally soft was uh, pejorative. It was soft as in weak and floppy and fluffy and all those negative words. So um, if as we're working with other people, the, the sort of warp and weft of those relationships, the way that we relate to other people is absolutely fundamental and central to the vast majority of enterprises of any kind. And so I think that accounts for this resurgence. Certainly in my own work, I think I've gone from being on the lunatic fringe to almost being in the mainstream, actually, in the last 20 years. So I think that there's a growing recognition of the importance of these things. 
I think personally, I'd like us to stop using that metaphor of hard and soft because I think it's too value laden. I think it suggests 